Um, so what we're planning to do today is to just kind of briefly go over um, the first Lego League Robotics at MSB, um, especially for people who don't know about it. Um, and then we're also going to um, have some discussion with Adam, who's at Kentucky School for the Blind. Um, and then I believe Tim Lockwood is also on um, standby and uh, will also share how he's made the robot coding accessible during Epic, because a lot of you um, may not have seen that yet. So we're actually going to try to do three things um, in this time span. And Travis is with me, um, and we're sharing a computer. So we'll see how it goes. Um, so the, the photo that is shown is this past year's dot five U dogs. So this is a combination of seventh and eighth graders. It is the largest team that we have ever had. Um, and every year there's something that stands out that is always different. But out of this group of kids, there are at least three or four of them that are often so shy and have such high anxiety that it can be difficult for them to even speak within a regular classroom. Um, and this is based at Maryland School for the Blind. So just imagine being a kid that is so shy that they don't want to speak to um, some of their teachers. Sometimes we can't even get um, one of the kids to give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And what happened this past year was really unusual because when it came to first Lego League and even when they learned that they were going to give up a Saturday and it's not part of a Saturday, it's all of Saturday. We met at 6 a.m. and the day did not end until I think 8 p.m. that night for some of them by the time we got back home. Um, but every single one of these kids wanted to be at this tournament. So this is the photo of after the tournament. Um, and I'm just really proud that we have all of these kids involved. The other thing that I try to emphasize um, to people is that coding is definitely important. Stephanie knows I'm a big fan of, of Quorum, but the other end of this is that Lego Robotics helps our kids with all of their social skills. So going back to that anxiety, it's giving them confidence. It's helping them to interact with other kids within their school and beyond other schools. So every year, we almost don't have to make any effort. Um, you know, we're an established team and we're, we're being able to expand relationships. Um, so that is our team. Um, they got the, the award for the project. Um, and um, Sydney Smith, who is sort of in the middle of that back row, uh, got the Youth Mentor Award. Um, and then you can see Travis is on the bottom left and I'm on the top left. And one of our other staff members is on the um, top right. So it takes a lot of staff and really an entire school support to get this going. Um, and Travis is gonna talk about the next team. Yeah, I think on top of, for this team, I think we also had three or four parents there and another staff member or two. So it really did, um, for 11 kids, it was a lot that this year. Um, all right, so next up we have our um, outreach-based team, 180 Optimum. So this is a team of students out in the public schools who actually travel to school every Saturday, or two Saturdays a month. And they meet with us and we, you know, we have our lessons, uh, we give them homework, they come back and kind of report back to us on some different things. So what they chose to do this year was do their project research, which, so for those of you who don't know, the first Lego League has a project component also where there's a theme every year. So they would do that at home and then kind of come back, report and work together on some things. And then we would spend two to three hours a Saturday just doing some coding and you know figuring out the mechanics of the robots and things like that so this is um like academics with these students are uh, pretty high up there so they they got a lot of these things pretty quickly and we even have some students on the team who at their school are involved in coding but they they don't use quorum there so they're using i think he was using um python the one student and it was a uh, he had to do an alternate method and wasn't quite getting all the coding concepts through it. So using this was just really great for him. Um, so this team here, um, we have 
four coaches and it consists of five kids. Uh, and one of those five is actually a junior coach. He was a senior this year. So giant student. Yes. Background. Yeah. The giants, yeah, the giant student <laughs> in the back. Um, and we also have uh, one student who was on, she's the student who won the award um, at the, at the other event because she came to both events. So she's a student at MSV, but she's really, really just enjoys coding and her mom is very supportive of her. So she was actually able to be on both teams. And so this one, she was a, on the team, the other one, she was like the junior coach. So she's holding what our project was, which was a large QR code made out of Legos that the students put together to make uh, an accessible description for the um, World Trade Center of Maryland over in Baltimore. And actually did work and a lot of people, one of the judges even called us out on it and said that it would not be a possibility and it is totally accessible and tactile. So they were pretty impressed with that. So we have uh, on the far left and right, we have uh, two of our staff members who are there helping us out. And then in the middle kind of kneeling are on the left is me and on the right is Miss Gina. And this also has um, the student on the, the top right is a student that literally refused to be involved in Lego Robotics until we started using Quorum. So she was adamant that she wasn't going to do anything until it was accessible. And now um, she's aged out of the first Lego League program and she wants to come back as a junior coach. That seems to be the new trend now um, and is really excited about Quorum Studio. Yeah, of, of this team, um, I think all four of the kids are going to age out this year. So we're looking forward to seeing what we get next year. So the, the sewer rats, um, none of these kids go to MSB. And this is something that was different this year, particularly for 180 Optimum. Um, the sewer rats had reached out to us as a local team. Um, that wanted to collaborate with our team. So I started this um, four years ago was when I got involved with First Lego League. And when we were at competitions, it was not unusual for kids to come up to us and um, be rather aggressive. Like what, what are blind kids doing here? How did, the, how did they do that? They would speak to me as a coach and not to our kids. And of course we would have to redirect everybody. Everything has changed now because of all of the advocacy efforts and with our um, consistent presence in the First Lego League Maryland community. So this is the first year that we've had a team that actually interacted with us in a fully collaborative way. We learned from them, they learned from us. Um, when we were discussing how difficult it was for students who are blind to um, always get the concepts of all the different mechanic, mechanical strategies that you can apply to Lego robotics. This team came to our school with multiple robots and attachments and gave 180 Optimum the time to look at the attachments and how to switch things out quickly. And they just shared some strategies. Everyone had pizza together and um, you know they were overeating and burping and doing all the things that our teenagers do. <laughs> Uh, um, at our first Lego League practices, and it was just a, a wonderful thing. So that's part of the magic that has happened with first Lego League. Um, the other advantage of this team is that they have a mentor that's based at um, UMBC, which is one of the local universities, and they were also in the midst of learning um, how to program with Quorum. Unfortunately, COVID-19 happened and the Maryland STEM Festival um, was canceled, but these teams were supposed to be side by side at tables and presenting together at the um, Pi Day event on March 14th. So we hope to reestablish a relationship with them. The plan was to get together and to teach them how to play goalball. Um, and they had interviewed our team about blindness and their whole project was focused on a audible um, emergency exit system. emergency exit system like at a mall um, so it was just a new step forward in collaboration and positive relationships we've gotten past the fascination with blindness and oh my gosh how do your kids walk or how do you how do you code it now they're really sitting down and they're speaking to the kids directly about it and 
learning about the different tools that they access. This is actually at a um, First Lego League event. So this was this past season. Um, and one of our students has the um, Lego robot. In this event, you had to stack up all those little buildings and um, take them to a designated area. If that area was the same color as the blocks, like with the red blocks, then you would get a massive amount of points. Um, so what we want to emphasize here is that if you're thinking about Lego robotics, you do not have to do First Lego League. But if you do First Lego League, it's really not that hard. And First Lego League says that to everyone. They try to make missions that are, are fairly close to the base so that you can go forward, you can leave something there, and then you can come back and do another mission. Um, every year that we've been involved in this, including when we were working out all the bugs and learning quorum, um, you know, we have always done well. We always score somewhere in the middle on robotics. So we've never been last place. Um, there are always first time teams and there are always things that go wrong. And we've experienced that and so have other teams where there's a loose wire or the brick just goes crazy. Um, the robot doesn't move. Um, but again, we encourage people to get involved with this. Um, you can't see much of the student's face, but he is smiling. You can tell that he's happy and he's surrounded by other kids. This is a public school student whose um, father actually works at NASA. Um, but this student has really benefited from being a part of First Lego League. And so the family has really been supportive in um, driving the distance to come to MSB and to get to those practices. Mm -hmm. All right, so next slide. So this really briefly um, just gives a shout out really to Tim Lockwood because uh, we had all the Lego parts, but I don't know what we would have done without um, Tim Lockwood giving us the um, micro SD card that runs the Lejos firmware. So um, we will share this presentation and there's a link there. It's also on the quorum webpage. Um, Tim says that he gets about a cup of coffee, I think, from uh, all of his work with these cards, but they're really finicky, and it's just um, very helpful to be able to buy these little cards off of Tim. Um, over on the right side, that's just simply a Lego brick, which is the brain of the robot. Um, it has two cords extending out of it, and they're attached to two Lego motors that are held together by an axle. This is usually my first lesson with kids um, or even parents who are new to first Lego League. I don't typically ask them to build uh, right away. At MSB, we tend to get a ton of kids around middle school. Um, usually we like to say two years too late where we wish that they would have came to us earlier. Sometimes they don't have fine motor skills. A lot of them have never even played with Lego, um, not to mention Lego robotics. So we give them something really simple to get things moving and get, give them that automatic reward. Um, so we have them do a simple code where they make one motor go forward and one motor go backward. Okay, go to the next slide. This slide is um, simply just highlighting that there are uh, working um, samples of programs on the Quorum website. When I first came to Epic, um, I didn't even realize that that was a working code, honestly. So I try to remember what it was like to be a new person. Um, the link is at the bottom of the slide and that's um, just a copy and pasted sample code. Um, Tim and I and others are reworking other sample codes so that we can share things more widely through schools and work together. But I wanted to definitely um, highlight that that is out there for anyone that is um, looking to get into Lego robotics. And our kids really do it, just love having the libraries there for reference. They use them all the time. Yeah, we're, we're very big on the libraries at MSB. Um, there's a big Harry Potter fan crowd here. So we talk about um, Hermione going to the library to do a little bit of research. We play that little movie clip um, and teach them about the libraries. Typically, we'll reference that working code, um, let them try it with robot or robot guts, as they like to say, and then we um, have them practice changing things in the code, making sure that they understand it, and then, of course, eventually doing their own code 
um, and of course, crashing robots. Mm -hmm. Let's go on to the next one. So this slide um, is linked to the first LEGO League page for anyone that wants information on that. Um, and we're always open to anyone that wants to reach out to us. Again, First Lego League really has three parts to it if you do consider um, joining the competition. There is the robot game, which has the mat and the Lego models. That's two and a half minutes um, for each run, and you do three official runs in a tournament, and you typically have one or two practice rounds. Then there's the project. So that was what um, Travis had referenced. 180 Optimum ended up doing the um, QR code project. Um, when they were working on accessibility at the Baltimore World Trade Center. Um, and by the way, they did consult with expert Sina um, Baram about the, um, how they could make things accessible there in an efficient and cheap way. So it was really cool for them to meet with Sina and um, also hear about his work with the 9-11 Museum. It, it was really spectacular for the kids. Um, the last category is core values, and First Lego League will emphasize that all three of these categories are equally important, and that's another reason why we like First Lego League. Um, core values is really about teamwork and what they call gracious professionalism. They have a trademark term called cooperation, so you're supposed to work with other teams, you're supposed to help problem solve. If something goes wrong at a tournament and somebody drops a robot and there's pieces crashing everywhere and you have extra pieces, it's actually expected for you to really help out the other team and empathize with them even though they are your competition. So that's a, another great feature of First Lego League. And it's really great to incorporate that in the class too because the kids behave a lot better. <laughs> Um, we wanted to step away from First Lego League and just show some other opportunities that um, have come about because of Quorum Lego Robotics. Um, we are connected with the Maryland STEM Festival, so we were um, invited to May the 4th Build Be With You. Um, that was, gosh, two years ago. Um, mm -hmm. So this is just showing our kids. Um, so we have two of our big kids on the left. They actually just graduated this um, school year. They came to MSV after they were too old, as they would say, to be in first LEGO League. Um, so they would come to um, the LEGO room after school so that they could learn how to code and do things. And they jumped on the opportunity to go to a maker festival. Um, on the right side, again, that's some of our kids um, just interacting with community members and looking at more LEGO EV3 robots. And I think, Travis, was this the one that had the different colors? Yeah, so the, the robot they're working with there actually uh, was programmed to drop different colored blocks in different cups. And it was really cool. Our kids were just really drawn to it. And you can actually see uh, there's two of our kids there who were able to feel the robot. So they let our kids just go right up and, you know, feel things, touch them, like see what they were doing. And that was just great. The, the environment there was, was really, um, I'm just everyone was included. It was really cool to see. And the cool thing that happens with our kids naturally is, you know, they can pull out their phones and they'll demonstrate to people what the problems are with accessibility. So they're constantly talking in a really positive way about forum. Um, they're constantly advocating for the brick to be made accessible with First Lego League, but they're also teaching community members how they can use an app on their phone, um, like Seeing AI, to try to read the text on the Lego EV3 brick screen. Um, they also demonstrate the apps that do color identification that we often use with the Lego bricks. So um, we are at the point where we can really, we're almost just coordinating now and can, um, you know, let the kids lead the way, which is, of course, what we want for them. This shot is just kind of highlighting um, some of the different things that have happened over the years. So on the left is a student who um, was on 180 Optimum and then had aged out and again was a junior coach. He was actually our first junior coach. Um, over on our right is um, one of our students who um, has actually um, competed nationally in the Braille Challenge, which seems, which seems to be another trend is that our LEGO team members are doing well in the Braille Challenge. Um, and at this um, 
instance, she is um, using an index card to braille uh, another kid's name. Um, so that's a First Lego League um, kid on her right or a sibling of somebody from another team. This is at a First Lego League event. Um, and then on the bottom left, we uh, made these business cards, I guess, two years ago. Yeah. Um, as a strategy. So we found that when we go to these tournaments, sometimes um, kids as well as coaches can be shy to talk to our team. So um, we worked with our kids on how to present these cards and introduce themselves as well as how to braille, um, you know, names on, on the index cards with the braille writers. So it's actually become quite the, the social um, trend and, and popular thing to do among all of our kids is to pass out these cards. Um, it's just great to see their confidence boost. And again, this happens with the kids that um, even when they come back after the first Lego League tournament still have those shy moments here. So first Lego League um, is a pleasant mystery to me on how we got some of these kids to interact with all of these strangers and be so active. Yeah. And the, the girl who is um, brailing kids names, I remember at one point we, I mean, she had a line of kids and I think she went through almost every kid there. So she actually began to braille like secret messages to the kids and handed out, uh, you know, like little cards that kind of had the alphabet on them and was tasking kids to find out the cards and they would come back and tell them what the message said. And it was, I mean, she just had a great time with that. And then we'll go through these next slides um, kind of quickly. It's really just kind of showing um, what we had on the um, business cards. So, um, on the front of the card is the MSB logo and name, and then the Quorum Bunny, which is sacred to all of our kids. Uh, <laughs> and then it has the name of both of the first LEGO League teams um, that MSB supports uh, with their team numbers. So they use that as an example of cooperation. When the business card is opened, um, it talks about Quorum and um, accessibility and advocating to LEGO headquarters in Denmark. And then um, side three is specifically talking about the Lego EV3 brick needs to be speech enabled. Um, it talks about the delay that does happen with the brick. Um, there are some ways to work around that, but it's a little complicated. Get in touch with us if you want to talk more about that. And then side four is really our favorite, and it was um, asking people to advocate with us. And um, First Lego League will just smile when we ask them how many um, emails they've had. So we're not sure what really happened with that, but people were also using the hashtag um, after these First Lego League events. So we think that that is part of what brought First Lego League representatives to visit our school. Um, but again, it's a, a great way to show the kids how to advocate in a positive and friendly way it's been really effective um, and I, I think it's a great experience for them. This next slide is what I call pre-Gina. Um, it is the first dot five UDOGS team. So this should be from 2012. Um, I would just point out that a lot of the first Lego League robots, if you ever get to go to a competition or, or serve as a judge, um, they are amazingly small and compact. I have seen the big, huge um, robots, and yes, we have done that here, um, but it's a, a game of strategy and sometimes of simplicity. So again, we just wanted to kind of show that and encourage people to think about the possibilities. Mm -hmm. And then last but not least, this was especially with um, Deanna in mind. Um, I wanted to share other ways that LEGO EV3 is used um, and integrating it as a strategy into academics. Um, Tufts University has a whole course on this called Novel Engineering. So the title at the top of this slide is actually a link to their page. And in this example, um, this is from attending the LEGO Symposium um, at Tufts University, I guess two summers ago. Um, they challenged people to use a Lego EV3 kit to rescue the turtle from being eaten by the little brother in the story of Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing. So um, they have a series of 
classic stories for the most part, where um, they encourage you to read the story with the kids and then pause it and say, what if they would have had a Lego EV3 kit and how could they have changed everything in this story? Um, they're very dramatic about it and I was surprised at how fun it was <laughs> um, to work with adults. And so we made a um, basically a protective barrier for the turtle and if the um, cage was open, then the ultrasonic sensor gave an alert and would save the turtle from being um, kidnapped or eaten. Um, so LEGO EV3 really could happen um, in all parts of academics and I think Quorum is really um, changing everything. Quorum Studio is spectacular and our kids already love it. Um, so we just hope to keep learning and moving along. Um, so with that, we really want to encourage anybody that's listening that wants to um, communicate with our teams or share code, we're open to that. Um, and we also want to highlight that Adam from Kentucky School for the Blind had attended Epic um, last summer and he has ventured into Lego Robotics. So we want to give him some time to kind of share his experience. Okay. Um, do you want me to just swap over to share screen at this point? Sure. Uh, okay, cool. All right, um, so unfortunately, I don't have any pictures to show off of any of the stuff that we worked on last year. I thought that I had something, um, but apparently I'm really bad at documentation. So I know that a couple of my students took videos of some of our projects. Uh, I have a couple of example codes I wanted to show just for things that we had come up with over the course of the year, as well as I wanted to talk about um, some of the things that I found uh, in working with robotics and, and Quorum in general um, with my students over the course of this last school year. One of the big hooks for the class that I was teaching them was the fact that we were going to get to play with Legos and build robots and make them do things. Um, I made them do a bunch of other stuff in coding as well, uh, and then I made them do a lot of math just because I'm a terrible person and I love to torture children with math. Um, but uh, let me go ahead and just talk about a little bit about what we've done. Um, beyond just learning the code, uh, some of the things that I really wanted to highlight um, with my students were um, using math that they had done in the past, like calculating uh, the circumference of a circle or determining how many degrees that we would have to turn a wheel or whatever it might be. Um, in order to get our robots to do different things. And so that integrated a lot of things that they had been doing in math class, specifically with geometry, um, and just doing measurements uh, to be able to make sense of the project that they were doing. So if we wanted the robot to drive forward three meters or four meters, how many times would the wheels have to rotate? What would have to happen if we were trying to set it to just move forward until a certain spot do we want it to move forward just with uh, forward motion for the uh, motors or do we want it to rotate by degrees or do we want it to rotate for a set amount of time? Um, oh, going back. We, it made my students uh, work on their fine motor skills just because a lot of them really hadn't experienced um, using Legos. And I know Gina and Travis mentioned this. Um, some of my students who have come in and I have um, anywhere between seventh grade all the way up to 10th or 11th grade uh, that were working with me doing Lego robots this last year. Um, some of my students, even in the 11th grade, had never really played with robots or played with Legos, and they'd never really had the chance to try and build something. So they didn't know how to plan out the process of building, regardless of whether or not they had some functional vision or no functional vision. So they hadn't, they hadn't really gotten the chance to play with that. So they got to build up their fine motor skills um, and it got to think, make them think about how they wanted to go about building it. Um, it also helped with them, uh, specifically with coding, it helped them work on their sequential reasoning, being able to make those decisions step by step by step by step and what you want to do when you want to do it with the robot. Um, a lot of them just like to think, oh, hey, there's the end goal. This is where I'm at. Someone help me get to that point. 
and I don't have to think about the process of what steps I have to take necessarily to make it to that point. Uh, and with the coding specifically, they really had to think it through. What do I have to do first and then second and then third? And I had to actually teach them about that because I don't know that all of them had really thought about their planning in that way in the past. Um, it also forced them to work on how they actually collaborate and share information. We used a lot of Google, um, Google Docs to share information because it was a simple way that everybody could all be editing the code at the same time. And then one of them would import it into sod beans and then we'd um, deploy it to the robot and then see if it worked or not. And in a lot of instances, it didn't end up working and we had to fiddle with it until we got it to work. Um, and then this last piece, learning about how they actually work together as a team. How is it that they interact with their team members and what can they improve to make themselves better communicators is something that they are beginning to finally realize is something that they really need to make sure that they have a good understanding of. Um, I had a couple of students who were very much, they've always been told that they are good leaders and they've always taken on the leader role telling what students need to do what and basically getting themselves involved in every little aspect of the project. And I had to force them to take a step back and let other people be the lead members um, and trying to make them break out of their comfort zone how they interact. So these are all different aspects of not just coding, but teaching robotics at the school um, that I've been able to help nurture and um, that you could as well if you started doing robotics, which I think is sort of the point of what Gina was trying to say, get involved, be part of it. Um, so here's an example of one of the things that we worked on near the end of the school year. We made a, a throw bot. Um, so I, I set out that the students had to have a stationary robot that would somehow get an object from one end of the table to another point on the table closer to the opposite end. Uh, and I gave them a few suggestions of how they could do it. They could push the object, they could have it picked up and thrown, they could do whatever they wanted to make it work. Um, and a few of the different things that, that were tried were we actually had a winching system that um, pushed forward using just a, a straight line and shoved the thing and then would retract back to reset. Uh, and that was a fairly simple code to figure out, but it took a while to get the actual build right. So that took a lot of um, building planning. Um, but the one that I really liked was the, the throw bot. They, my students actually named it the Yeater 9000. I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the term yeet, um, but people say it when they're throwing stuff. Um, and so the code ended up working pretty straightforward. It's just sequential. Um, and what the kids did was they made sure to set the motor speed. We had to use two motors to make an arm that would lower and raise and a claw on it that would actually grab the object. Um, and so they had, to open the, uh, they had to open the claw, then have it lean forward, then they had to have the claw close around it, then they decided to call it raise your head for having the claw lift back up. And then the yeet action, which was very interesting, we had to go through a number of different iterations of this to get it quite right. Um, they had to have the claw open just a little bit so that it was a loose grip on the object. And then they made the claw uh, slam forward to throw it. Um, and it actually launched it a solid meter through the air and then it slid the rest of the way across the table, which was pretty exciting. Um, and then they actually also decided to just toss on a screen input that, that said yeet at the end for funsies. Um, but this was a code that didn't require a whole lot of um, complex thinking just as far as it went. It was just one thing after the other. As long as it was in order, it should work. Um, but then we went into doing the, the final project before uh, the plague hit and we all had to disband and go to NTI. Um, in this one, I was like, all right, so you guys all use canes on a daily basis. That's how you guys get around. That's how partially how you identify yourselves as having a visual impairment. Um, let's make a robot that actually uses a cane and can identify and detect objects in front of it. And how would it respond? How would it react? And so we created the wacky cane robot and we went through 
I think four or five different versions of this code. Um, I have two versions that were somewhat functional. One of them didn't actually work and I sent that over to Tim Lockwood. Um, but the second version, which I didn't actually get to share with him because I found it only just this morning, um, actually used actions in the classes, which they, the students really hadn't been introduced to. Uh, so I got to use this as a way of showing how classes and actions can work in a concrete manner, not just in say a video game setting where you can have things that, diff that work using actions, um, but we can also create those actions to physically do something, which was very meaningful for my students. Um, and so then we ended up creating uh, three separate actions or well, four separate actions other including action main. Um, we had a sweep motion where the cane would sweep back and forth. Uh, we had a forward motion action where it would just dictate it moving forward. And then we had a whack action. So for instance, if the cane detected using a touch sensor, if the cane detected um, an obstacle of some kind, it would wind up and try and whack it out of the way to let it know to get out of the way. For instance, in the real world, one of those examples might be, say, you're trying to cross the street and a car has put pulled into the uh, driveway, or not the driveway, the crosswalk just a little bit, and you detect it with your cane, what would you do? You'd probably either walk around it or you'd tap it out of the way to let them know that, hey, you shouldn't be parked, or you shouldn't be parked and stopped at this spot because you're in the way. Um, and so we had them, we had them go through this and the students tried a number of different things to try and make it work. I helped them troubleshoot it because they hadn't really worked with actions before. Um, and we finally got something that actually ended up working. The only thing that we ran into was the, and I think Tim, you mentioned this on um, the link that you posted into robot, uh, into the robot, uh, robot channel for Slack earlier, which was that if the um, touch sensor isn't pressed directly on, it doesn't respond. So that was the final thing that we just couldn't get to work quite right, despite the fact that we had got the rest of the code to work pretty well. Um, but those are just a couple of the projects that we did this last year. We did a bunch of other ones as well, trying to drive the robots around this, the classroom um, and trying to figure out exactly how much the wheel should have to turn if we were having the robot turn on an axis, basically like it was going in a circle on itself. Um, and it was, there was a whole lot of math involved in that and it was just a lot of learning. And that's about all I've got. So I'm gonna probably turn it over to Tim Lockwood now. Um, thank you guys for listening. I appreciate it. Adam, I have a question. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, my que yeah, uh, when, can you, in your classroom, you have several students at once, right? How many students do you have and how many robots? Okay, so that's actually, that's have? a really good question. Um, so I had two classes where I was teaching coding and robotics this last year um, and uh, each of those classes had four students in them. Um, actually, that varied throughout the year. At one point, we had five in one of the classes, but the, one of the students came in very late and didn't have as much background as everyone else did. Um, and each class had a single robot to work with. I have two uh, Lego brain bricks and two whole sets um, of the EV3 kits. Uh, and so I basically designated one kit goes to one group and the other kit had to go to the other. Um, so we didn't get to keep any of the final products that we made at the end of a given um, coding project, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay, I've taken over screen sharing and you know, do interrupt me at any time if you have questions or wait to the end. Uh, I'm just gonna briefly reshow or reshare this uh, website that I've been working on. The original thought was this was, oh, um, it was about a year ago I started working on it thinking, what if I have to present or teach a section of, on robots to complete beginners at Epic? Well, uh, we didn't do that this year because <laughs> we're not together and um, we did do a little sharing about robots, but not actual teaching. Uh, it quickly evolved into something that I would use as my own students. And then uh, the thought was I would open it up to the world for anybody that wanted to go through tutorials 
basically lessons, about 70 eventually will be uh, the number of lessons or challenges that exist within it. I broke it down, you know, just into your motors, buttons and sound, and then sounds and music sensors. So I actually have my version of Adam's cane robot done and I added it into mine. Um, I, I, I ended up taking a slightly different approach to it, but it was based on his idea and the challenge to his kids. So I'm gonna go find that. It would be under touch sensors. There it is, number 24. And this is fairly typical of the pages, but this one is a challenge page. So the text appears at the top. We have a little visual thing of the code. And then we have that full code in text later. I'm just gonna go ahead and run the robot uh, video that I have so you get an idea. Every code that I did is supported with a narrated video uh, with some captioning built into it as well. Uh, let's see if I can get this to work. The forum studio screen appears with the Swatch 24 challenge code appearing. The robot starts at the right side of the screen. It lifts its cane up and lets it drop. Approaches a pile of books and it stops. We're seeing some close-ups of, of the robot here. We've got a small motor in the front to drive that cane. That is the end of Touch 24 Challenge. And Tim, by the way, I think that that was a really fantastic um, means of adapting it and changing it up to make it work a little bit more effectively. Yeah, it, it, it still fails because of that physical problem with the touch sensor. Now I have come up in my mind with a solution to that. We simply need a more sensitive switch. Uh, and I was visiting um, at ATCI uh, down in Florida where I saw a lot of people building their own sensors for EV robots. And I'm really thinking a really simple, simple mechanical switch that still just says, uh, I'm down, I'm up. Uh, and then I would have to develop some libraries to make that work with Quorum. But I, I'm still thinking I'd like to give that a try and then have two motors so that I have the same motion that I use with my cane uh, happening. Uh, it won't be uh, anything I do right away, but I, it's a nice challenge for me to go ahead and do. Just demonstrating, I also put the code here in a copy and paste format uh, without any comments. And then down below, we get the full text of the code for those using screen readers. It just seems to work better this way. May I ask a question? Absolutely, I'm ready. Uh, why have a cane? Because if I'm not mistaken, you already have an ultrasonic sensor on the bot. So why even have anything that will make contact? Well, uh, the, goal, the goal of it was actually just to more make a, an analog for the students at my school, not so much to actually not take, or not so much to take advantage of all the technology that we have available for the robot. It was, um, in the event that they didn't have an ultrasonic sensor or a color sensor or something like that, but we did have a touch sensor available, how could we make it react the same way or in a similar way to a student who has no vision traveling down the hallway? That was where that project idea came from. Uh, okay. Yeah, that was my first thought is, why are we doing this with the touch sensor? And then I realized, oh, because we have one and somebody said, hey, let's put a touch sensor on the end of our cane and see how it works. I really think, uh, you know, it gave me some nice, it, for me, when I use this to teach, which I haven't done this yet, but it will be talking ab about physical engineering, how real world conditions and devices some, will sometimes, because of the engineering, not function the way we would like them to. And that's a lot of the actual building of robots. 
Uh, it's not in the environments that we run robots in, I make sure I have hard surfaces and carpets both because robots do different things in those settings. And Pranav, back to, to, to your point, like obviously technologically it would make more sense to use an ultrasonic sensor that detects when it's too close to something. Um, but that wasn't, that wasn't the main point of the project. Yep. Yeah, I get you. I mean, I was thinking more from, I'm coming from a blind user perspective. And I was like, uh, okay, <clears throat> I still have to make contact with something. Right, 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 right. But how big are these robots? I mean, how big is this cane? So it's uh, maybe six inches long, give or take, depending on how you build it. Um, the cane itself is about six inches long. Uh, the six robot okay. with the cane total might be, maybe total a foot long to six inches uh, or eight inches wide, give or, say, give or take. Okay. And I'm really surprised that Amanda hasn't uh, spoken up and said, but it looks like a pecking chicken. Because that was the first thing I thought of when I ran I mean, it the first time. I mean, I was nice and I understood <laughs> the, uh, the, the differences in that particular sensor and how slamming down, I mean, it's kind of how some of my kids use their cane. So, you know, it worked. Yeah, I thought it was introductory cane skills. It was quite accurate. <laughs> the, the version that we had tried uh, had the cane sweeping left to right in front of our robot. Um, but as, as was noted, the touch sensor doesn't really respond unless it's directly impacted straight on and a head-on collision. So that didn't necessarily work quite the way we wanted it to. Okay, I have... Tim, I have a question. Um, yes. Or, uh, yeah. One of, one of the things uh, when um, when uh, I was building the robot, uh, one of the frustrations is that um, when a person starts to explore the robot, somehow the robot can collapse or break easily. Do you have any suggestions in regards how to, once you build your robot and people is handling, how to make sure that it doesn't collapse and pieces start to fall apart? Um, it's a matter of design. I have gotten a design that I'm very happy with. It gives me access to all the ports that I want easy access to. It does have places that, multiple places that I can attach sensors. What I'll be doing is taking it apart and rebuilding it with instructions and with photos. Okay. Uh, I, I want to do it both ways. Uh, basically, you have to have lots of connections that interlink, and those are a little bit, it takes a great deal of time to construct something like that. So we just have to um, do that. I have also been known to take and put a, a, a rubber band <laughs> around the body of my robot <laughs> to keep it compressed so it doesn't okay. come apart. Thank you. You know, you know officially I thought the answer I was that. duct tape. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, well, that's that's always my first go-to is duct tape. They have also built um, almost like a a protective barrier around some of the first Lego League robots, um, where they're using just a little a square that fits over the robot and really protects it. And then when it's running, it will also allow it to um, purposely run into a wall and then that's a great time that they use that touch sensor once it makes contact then it knows to change direction so there's actually a lot of strategies and Deanna there's also a motorcycle build it's still a lot of pieces though it's I want to say like 86 pieces or something but it is one of the smaller things that you can build that is is very compact okay okay Thank you. Adam or, Adam or Tim, with the sensors, with the cane idea, can you have multiple touch sensors? So you could have one on either side of this cane thing that if you swept it, it would still bump something on? The yeah, side. theoretically. I mean, the, there are two touch sensors that come with every kit, from what I understand, and then you can just buy more as needed. Um, I just think that the touch sensor could be updated to be more um, reactive. Because I was just wondering with the sweeping motion, if it was on the sides of your 
sweeping object, then it could tap, you know, the wall on the side or the, you know, as it's See, tapped. that's actually, that's an idea we hadn't considered. So that might have, that might have been more effective, especially with the sweeping back and forth motion. That so just thanks, makes sense. Sorry. Thanks. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, the uh, other way to do this would be uh, if you have a roller tip with an encoder, like in a stepper motor, and you could maybe count steps. That could be interesting for, I don't know, distance or something with this. Tim, you yeah. could probably answer that better than I could. Yes, uh, that's my next major project is to uh, mount another wheel that's being turned by the, that's turning and I'm getting the data from the turning instead of driving with that wheel so that I can measure distance and make use of that. Uh, my first attempt will just be a motor on a stick so that I could like roll it across the floor and measure a distance. But later I wanna give it to use, it'll give me speed. It won't give me direction right now, but I have my gyroscope for doing that, but I want to try that. So it'd be that idea that you talked about is the motor can actually be a sensor and t give me speed based on rotations. Um, Tim, where do, we, where do we find your website? Um, I, the, the URL, I mean. Yeah. It, I can find it on the internet. <laughs> yeah, it's on the internet. Um, normally, I just post it up on there. Let me just real quick do that. I'll put it in the um, general channel on Slack. Okay, and thanks. Should be appearing momentarily. Hey, Tim, if we still have time, I think we got a couple minutes. Could you give some examples of um, how you've used robots with kids who have multiple disabilities? Oh, sure. Uh, I'll do that. Um, uh, I um, have been working with some very severely disabled kids um, and it's, it's kind of fun to put them on the floor in our activity room and then have a robot that makes sounds and moves. And sometimes they want to go after that robot. And the current, the one that I did most often was the robot would run away as they got closer. And then they, you know, kids that were not normally motivated to go anywhere would suddenly say, oh, there's a robot there. They'd go for it, it would move. I could get them to go all the way across the room where normally they would just sit in one place. So my OTs and PTs got involved with me on that one. Uh, and we made it more sophisticated, you know, m making the robot do different paths and making different sounds, seeing what sounds were most attractive. Uh, we have some that have some vision. So we started to put the flashing lights on it uh, to catch their attention. But that was really fun. Other things that we do is when they, if they do get, we can make a robot that when they touch it, it does different sounds. And that, that seemed to fascinate them for a little while at least. Great. <clears throat> hey, hey, Tim, I have a question in regards to, um, I know that you, uh, prior to this presentation, you had used the word uh, pedagogic um, in the way that you were um, designing the, the lessons and the progression in the lessons. Could you um, uh, explain the, the, of how you are presenting your lessons in your website and what is the lowest, where is the beginning point and uh, how can we progress with that? Okay, the, the concept that I went with, and you'll have to put up with a very ancient pedagogy of education, I'm using psycho-regenerative. In other words, we learn by doing is basically the thought. It, it, it was used um, at, at some point in the past to teach foreign languages. Uh, it was the idea we would immerse someone into the language and by giving them examples 
they would learn it. I use that same method to teach music to the visually impaired and it worked out really nicely. And I have a, I believe it will work nicely with teaching this basic computer programming. What I wanna do is through a, a large series of lessons is build their vocabulary of programming. And I purposely have made all of my programs in this particular website linear. So we don't have actions in classes yet. Uh, I may add that in some of the ones that I have planned in the future where we're doing more complex things, that would be very helpful. But in the beginning, we start out with five line codes. Uh, even Adam's, uh, the, the Kane one I did of Adam's, that was only 29 lines of code. So we have very little, we're trying to eliminate as much of the typing as possible. When people look at my codes, you may say, it's not what's shown on the Quorum website. Uh, we've, over the years, we've found ways to make that code more concise and more meaningful. So I need to take my other little thing, a, a part of being on the curriculum committee now is to update those uh, library entries and the tutorials to reflect this is the more effective least amount of keystrokes way to write a program for a Lego robot. So now was that the kind of question that you were yes. asking? Yeah, that is fantastic. I I I, I like that um you know I, I, I would like to have that added into the options that we have um, because it facilitates for someone like me that I'm not teaching robotics all the time to have the work done for, for me in regards to choosing not, not having to really think what I need to choose, but just have it all done, things that had worked already for, for, for uh, you and, and work well. Yeah, I share the, plate, the complete code visually, and I do that because my thought is my learners that are sighted, I want them to look at the screen and type their code in instead yes. of always copying, pasting. But the copy and paste option is always there as well as the full code just in text uh, for those that find that easier to work with. So I've tried to hit all the different learning modalities that I can. Okay, thank you, Tim. Thank you for You're your welcome. work. And Gina, that's all I have to say unless there's more questions. I have just one. Oh. Go ahead, Deanna. No, I, my question was, uh, uh, I, we were talking about the robot with the cane. And one of the things I, I just wanted to make a comment um, that I really like uh, uh, about that robot will be the, is the mechanics of it. Because it provides um, uh, the extension that you, you put in there in the middle of the, um, the block or in the block, that extension representing the cane moves up and down, up and down. And I think that, um, uh, I think that brings the, uh, you know, the, the mechanical part of movements and joints in, in the design of the robot. And I really like that, even if we don't need to call it a cane, I, I really found it interest, interesting. Just wanted to let you know that. Oh, thank you. So I hope that's that's been helpful to everybody. I think um, you know you can do just about anything with Lego Robotics, and Tim's website is awesome. We're going to be revamping some of the stuff on the Quorum website, um, but please feel free to reach out. And there's lots of code that we can share that's at all different levels. Um, but we hope that this has been helpful, and um, thank you for tuning in. Thank you.